It never ceases to amaze me, brethren, is um, how we see some artists, some uh, famous singers, some uh, famous TV personalities, basically having everything, but in the end having nothing. Because you can see their lives are empty, and, uh, and they destroy themselves with drugs, and some of them, uh, sometimes through drugs, kill themselves accidentally, others commit suicide. And, and it just shows that successful people can be very successful, uh, but that success does not always necessarily bring true happiness. And uh, it's particularly significant because for us as Americans, in our Declaration of Independence, says that one of our goals is the pursuit of happiness. And uh, the question is, um, how do we pursue that happiness? Um, is it the right way? Because the pursuit of happiness, per se, might lead to an empty shell. And we've got to be careful. But look at the example of Solomon, and he wrote to us in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, he, he shows uh, some examples here of, because the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about how he tried everything, and in the end, as we'll see later, he realized that oh, things can just be empty shells in the end. Look, you know, you can have a certain amount of joy and satisfaction from little things, but that is not the main thing. Those things should not be the be-all and end-all. And here is an example in chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Here is uh, Solomon saying, I said in my heart, come now, I'll test you with myrrh, um, therefore enjoy pleasure. Uh, but surely this uh, also was vanity. I said to laughter, madness, and to myrrh, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my, my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men uh, to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I made my works great. I built myself houses. I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees uh, of the grove. You can see how, how it's focused on I did this and I did this and it's trying to have this pursuit of happiness. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions I had more things, more stuff, you know, of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled before I excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from my, any pleasure. Uh, for my heart re rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. It was all like running after the wind. There was no profit under the sun. You know, brethren, the pursuit of happiness, when that becomes like a be, be all and end all, <coughs> can bring us to a point that material blessings in the end do not satisfy. Yes, they may give some satisfaction temporarily, but it's not the real 
internal satisfaction. Brethren, we've got to be careful and we've got to understand that the way of get is not happiness. Yeah, was uh, Solomon says, I got this and I made myself this for myself. I acquired this. It was he was all all on the way of get. <coughs> but the way of get is not the way of happiness. Because the way of true happiness is the way of get. It's a whole different approach. Look at how it says here in Proverbs. Pro Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15 verse 13. It says, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. You know, happiness is a matter of the heart. And it says, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. But sorrow of the heart or by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And a little bit further, uh, in verse 15, it says, All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. Brethren, happiness is a matter of the heart. It's a matter which is inside us. It's not the things around us that make us happy. It's what's inside us. It's a matter of the heart. Look at also chapter 17, verse 22. So if we just turn a page over, it says, A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. You know, a lot of unhappiness can make you sick. A lot of stress and unhappiness and difficulties can make people sick. And uh, positive thinking, a positive outlook can help us in many ways can help us. Uh, while we're in Proverbs, just let's go back a little to Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. And it, yeah, it's talking about, in this section from verse 20 through 27, it's talking about how we need to uh, put God's way first and God's law but it says here in verse 23, Keep your heart with all diligent, diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. You know, happiness is a state of mind and of the heart that we've got to guard. We've got to guard what goes into our mind, what thoughts, what goes into our heart, because out of that it springs, as it says, the issues of life. Of life, And so today, brethren, I thought I'll take a different approach than uh, maybe uh, we've taken in the past, but it's to look at seven keys to happiness in our life by developing emotional maturity. Seven things, in other words, that you and I can do to help us develop some emotional maturity in our lives so that we may be happy. And those things are not related to how much more things we have, material things, but are related to a mental state in which is switched from taking to giving. Instead of being a way of get, it's a way of give. It's a mental state that is able to express joy, enthusiasm and happiness at the right time, but also is able to express sorrow, anguish, and compassion, and mercy, and sympathy, also at the right time. It's a, a mental state that will exercise self-control of our attitudes, of our moods, of our feelings, of our own tempers. And so, let's look at seven points to help us develop emotional maturity so that you and I can be happy so that this pursuit of happiness is based on the right basis which is a godly basis and so the first point is accentuate the positive be cheerful and thankful for what we have accentuate the positive avoid the, ne avoid the negative avoid uh, looking always at the 
dark side and says, oh, well, poor me, and these things, avoid it. But be grateful for little things, for little things. A little flower, uh, for a little bird, for uh, the singing of a bird, the sound of that, for a beautiful view, for a simple, plain meal. Being grateful for those things, enjoying those simple things in life so that you're not enduring it, but you're enjoying simple things because those are important. Look how Paul put it in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. It says here, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. You know, brethren, God, in a sense, is ordering us to rejoice. To look at these simple things and accentuate the positive so that we can be happy. Look a little bit further. He goes on in verse 8. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true. In other words, look at those positives. It's true. Look at, focus on that. Whatever things are noble. It's noble. Focus on that. Whatever things are just, focus on that. Whatever things are pure, focus on that. Uh, whatever things are lovely, focus on that. Whatever things are a good report, focus on that. If there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So accentuate the positive. Be on the positive. As we heard in the sermon yet, God's goals are much bigger than ours and sometimes yeah we go through little trials and difficulties in the meantime but have absolute faith and trust that God in the end has something far better for us far better for us a far bigger goal for us and so as we go through these things accentuate the positive I know it's difficult nowadays when we just listen to the news you hear some of the things and you say, well, that's so bad. Whether it's speeches of people or whether it is what people say, what it's people do, and they say, oh no. And you and I, I do, I pray, let thy kingdom come. When I see these things, I say, Father, let your kingdom come, the sooner the better. But on the other side, we need to be look at the positive as well and look for things so that we don't allow ourselves to be dragged down by what's happening around in the world. Focus on the positive. Have the emotional control to focus on the positive. A little bit further, yeah, in verse 11 says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul is saying, I mean, we're living in times of difficulty. He was in difficult situations, but he learned to be happy in whatever situation he was. And I think that's what we need to have. That spiritual point of view uh, that it's not the physical things around but it's what's inside in our heart to accentuate the positive. The second point is to forget what is behind. Now obviously we can never forget everything that is behind but we need to put it in perspective and move forwards onto the things ahead. In other words, don't cry over spilled milk. Uh, don't sit there and keep just sobbing and thinking about those things that are behind. We've got to move forwards. Don't make yourself miserable uh, by keeping thinking about those things of the past. We've got to move forwards. In this same book of Philippians, if we just go one page behind in your Bible, probably, which is Philippians chapter 3, or maybe on the same page, in mine is in the same page, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. It says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. We need to forget those things that are behind. Now, you can get taken and say, Well, I'll never forget about maybe you never, but you put it off your mind. You, you, Try and put it off your mind. Try and let it go. 
forget those things that are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. We need to reach forward to those things that are ahead. And then he continues, says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as many as are mature, it was as many of us that have that maturity, that emotional maturity, have this, this mind. And if it is anything that you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. It was that absolute trust that God's plan is far greater than what yours is. God thinks a lot bigger than what you and I think. And he will intervene for us in due time. But look forwards, go forwards, don't look back. Don't keep looking back. Look forwards. Now you may look back and say, oh well, I've done this thing wrong. And I've done this thing wrong and I feel terrible. Well, what does that should guide us to do? It should guide us to proper repentance. A repentance which says, I'm going to stop doing that and I'm going to do something different. It should really motivate us to say, I'm going to be a different person. For instance, yeah, in Second Corinthians, chapter 7, Paul talks about that true repentance. In the first letter of Corinthians, there was a man that was committing an, a, a very abominable sin and he was put out of the church. And then in Second Corinthians, Paul refers to it, yeah, in chapter 7, that this man had repented and they should now let him back in the church. And then he says in verse 9, but now I rejoice not that you were made sorry not that you were made sorry yes when that was happening and you were sorry but that your sorrow led to repentance it was that sorrow led to a change in the way of life that was positive for you were made sorry in a godly manner and that sorrow a godly sorrow means that you looked at the past and he says, I'm going to change. And with God's help and with his spirit working with you, you change. That's what is in a godly manner. That you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow, verse 10, produces repentance. It was a change which leads to, in the end, to salvation. Not to be neglected. But the sorrow of the world which is continuously thinking about, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but never doing anything about it, the end result is death. Because there's not true godly sorrow with repentance. So the sorrow of the world is brooding over it forever and ever and ever, and that leads to sadness and death. But godly sorrow leads to a change. Now, one of the reasons that we might find difficult is we might think, well, I've done this thing wrong and that person's never going to forgive me or I'm never going to be, that's never going to be forgiven. That might be a reason that we kind of keep going back onto something. But look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Look at what Christ said there in Matthew 6, verse 14. After the, the model prayer, Christ in Matthew 6 verse 14 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So if, if we are in a position that says, Oh, I've done this thing in the past, I don't know how that's ever going to forgive What is it that we need to do? And I need to do. We need to forgive others for everything, just forgive. And when we forgive, because we're forgiving, God will also forgive us. And we have to absolutely have confidence that God will do it. Have absolute confidence that we do it. So forgive others, and then you and I can have confidence that you and I will be forgiven. Admit error, be sorry, and change. It's not a broken record that keeps doing the same thing. Change, repent. Then we have this confidence that Jesus Christ's blood will wash us. 
This is what Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 9. If you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. You see, so if we've done something wrong, we must forgive others and, and then ask for Christ's blood and that, if you've done something that, then at baptism it's all washed away. And this is how it works. In verse 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, which you apply at baptism, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, cleans your conscience. I mean, it's not just going to clean you, it's actually going to make your conscience and my conscience in other words, you're not going to have a guilty conscience anymore. And that is a miracle. That is a miracle that you can, after that, actually trust in God that whatever you come to pass, this is genuine repentance, because you put it in Christ's hands, that conscience is not It's cleanse your conscience. There was this no more a guilty conscience from dead works. But why are the works dead? Because you don't do them anymore. You've repented, you've changed. That's why they're dead. So it's the guilty feelings that you had from things that you don't do anymore because they're dead. But those guilty feelings have been cleansed, have been washed. And now we change that to serve the living God. In other words, by living a new life, Christ living in us, and we living as a new man or as a new woman. So, God, as through Christ, has guided us to the power of His Spirit to serve Him in a new way. So, this is not selfish. This is not for myself. This is for others, to serve others, to look outwards for the better of others and therefore that gives you genuine peace of mind and eternity and will give you genuine happiness okay so start a new day clean you can start every day clean because we have this hope and we have stopped those works because they did as it says, they did work. They're not practicing it anymore. So that's a second root point or principle that will help you in the pursuit of true happiness, of godly happiness. Happiness the way God would like it to be is to let those sins of the past go and work towards the new God. A third point I have is that quite often it's easy for us as human beings to get into little arguments. It's so easy for us to get into little arguments with people. It's so easy. Maybe you have a slight, slight different point of view. And next thing, this becomes so big. And bang, you have a big argument and bickering about it. And so the point here is avoid arguments and bickering. Our life is too short and it's so easy to get involved. So let's avoid that. That will give you also a better health, that's for sure. Let's avoid that. Now look in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you look at verse 2, we have 2 Corinthians chapter 10. of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every eye thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God 
bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Brethren, it is actually a spiritual warfare. And that means there are these little thoughts and ideas and things that come into our minds at any time and generate a big argument, a big position that I stand for this and you said this and the way you said it, bang, bang, and next thing the whole thing explodes like snowballing out of out of the corner. strongholds in our in our minds. You know, think about in the old days we had a fort. We go to Europe and go to some of those areas where there's forts. There's those strongholds, you know, that people defend and then there's a stronghold right right where they, they hold it strong, like the the fence. And you know sometimes we we overcome certain things but there are little things that are still stronghold inside us. Difficult to overcome. Uh, I don't know what they are. I mean, we all may have or not. But it says, yeah, that these things do happen. We do have strongholds in us. And God's spirit, God gives us um, strength. Gives us, uh, God gives us strength in, in various ways to overcome and to fight whatever weaknesses we may have to be strong. And Father and, and brethren, uh, that's what we've got to uh, do. We've got to uh, use God's Spirit to, um, to overcome those problems. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's see if it stands now. So we do have to overcome. These strongholds exalt themselves. In other words, they make themselves tall and, and, and big. And we've got to cast them down. As it says, bring every thought into the captivity and obedience of Christ. That's what we've got to do. Bring every thought into that obedience of Christ. All right. <coughs> Let's look at uh, another example, which is in Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30. Verse 33. Proverbs 30. Verse 33. For as the churning of milk produces butter, and the wringing of the, no the nose produces blood. You know when, when you take uh, milk and you keep churning and churning, you end up with butter. And if you keep blowing your nose, blowing your nose, blowing your nose, you, sooner or later it's going to start bleeding. And it says the same thing. The forcing of wrath produces strife. So if, if you are forcing an issue, and allowing this argument to become bigger and bigger and bigger, it's going to lead to an argument, to strife. And so we've got to learn to avoid arguments. If there's some area that you disagree with somebody, how do you handle it? because disagreements are going to occur. And obviously, we need to use tact and diplomacy. You know, look at the example of Paul. If you turn with me to Acts 17. Paul was in Athens. And there, there was a lot of idolatry, worshipping of different idols and different gods. And he could have told people, you people are a bunch of pagans with all these idols and things like that. 
But that would have not been very diplomatic, quote unquote, or very tactful. And so what did Paul say? In Acts 17, verse 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. He was very tactful. He didn't say to them, you're a bunch of pagans. But he said, look, I see that you are very religious. And then he proceeded to tell them of how they had even a statute to the unknown God. And he says, and this is the God that I want to talk to you about. And so he uses that as an opportunity to, to put it in, in, in a right way. Because his mind, Paul's mind, was on the good of those people. Why? Because one day, one day, those people understand the truth. One day, they'll come to repentance. One day, because they are called, they will be in God's church. And imagine if they would go back and say, Oh, I remember you, Paul, that you came around and said, You bunch of pagans. That would have not been very good. So they'll say, Oh, I remember Paul when he came there to Athens. And yes, he tried to tell us, but we just couldn't see it. Our minds were closed. And yeah, I can see how God was working with you. Look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 32 and 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 32 and 33. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. In other words, give no offense to, to the Jewish people or to the Gentiles, to these, he could have said to the pagan people that don't worship God, or even to those that are in God's church. Give no offense. In other words, whatever you do, make sure that you don't offend anybody. Verse 33, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, you see, he was not seeking self, get for himself. He was seeking on the welfare of the others, for the good of the others, even though for the time being they were doing things wrong. But he was thinking of the bigger picture. Like we heard in some minute, that bigger, bigger goal, that ultimate goal, that one day they'll be called, one day they'll see the truth, one day they'll understand. So, don't cause offense to them. But the prophet of many, that they may be saved. Yes, he was looking for the good of others. He had an attitude of mental, emotional control, emotional maturity of focusing outwards. And because of that, he was avoiding any little arguments that could be there that would not be necessary. As it says elsewhere, uh, I think it's here in Romans 12. Let's look at that. Romans 12. Romans 12. Uh, verse 18. That's right. That's, as, as our science, it says elsewhere. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceable, peaceably with all men. As much as it depends on you. So if there's something that you're going to say that is going to incite or cause trouble, don't do it. As much as it's in your ability. Live at peace with all men. Now, if there's things that are not in your ability, that they're fighting against you and there's nothing you can do, well, that's a different story. But as much as you can do, live at peace with all men. If it is possible, uh, uh, verse 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Let God sort it out. You don't have to sort it out. You know, uh, we had, uh, my wife reminded me uh, early on today, 
when uh, when our children were uh, younger, we had situations in which uh, there were certain let's call it frictions between our children and maybe other children and even other families. And uh, and then we had a situation where I said to one of our children, "Take the high road." And the child, deliberately not saying he or she, the child said, uh, what do you mean? The high road is apology. And say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to come across in the way you see it. I'm sorry, I apologize. And then when that person comes back to you and says, yes, but, 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 and hits you more things, then you still apologize. And when he's going to come back and hit you more things, still apologize, take the high road, not lying, but see and say, hey, I'll try and I'll make sure that you don't do that way again, come across a better way. See? And you know what? That family, I was at that meeting, I was very proud of my child because he or she handled it exactly like I said, I suggested, uh, biblical, you know, don't avenge yourself, leave it to God. And and that that family came back and the child again said the same thing and I was I was saying, Wow, you know, the child was able to, to take it through. But you know that the truth now is that family with our family, they love one another and they're such good friends. Take the high road. Avoid arguments and victory. There's always an excuse, an opportunity to have an argument because that's what Satan wants. And a tiny little thing can actually be blown out of proportion. But let's avoid that. And let's have the mind on the other. As it says here in verse 21, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's what I, I've termed it, take the high road. Overcome evil with good. Take that high road. The other road is the low road which everybody wants to take. Take the high road. God's road. Trust in God. He'll sort it out. And make peace. As much as it's possible, live peaceable with all men. So, what is the motive? You see, if the motive is not self, but the good of the other, and taking the high road should be easier if it's the right motive. The next uh, point I have is whatever situations you have uh, that might be difficult, if they have to be confronted, confront them in a godly manner. Like that situation was that they had to talk to one another. They had to go the child and this family and and I was present because their parents were present and uh, but it had to be tackled and so that's what it says here in Matthew 18 in Matthew 18 you know the scripture very well in Matthew 18 it gets to a point where the thing has to be addressed now uh, as I mentioned forget those things that are behind, forgive. There's many times where you can just let go. Let go. Yeah, maybe the best is just to let it go. But when it gets to a point, as it says here in Matthew 18, um, Matthew 18, verse 15, it says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now, quite often, a lot of people put emphasis on this verse by saying, the brother sins against you, on me, He's, he offended me, therefore I have to go and sort it out and tell him or tell her that he or she is wrong. You know, go into the high horse and say, God, you are wrong because you offended me. I don't believe that's the right way of reading this verse. Because 
yes, indeed, he has offended and sinned sin, sin against you, but if we look at it from the point of view of the best for the other person, if the other person is sinning, and that sin is now affecting that person, yes, he's sinning against you, but is it, when somebody is sinning against you, there's a lot of other things as well there. And, and that is affecting the, the spiritual outcome of that person in a way that you want to help him or her in a positive way because it's going to affect him in a negative way that he could lose salvation because now you're thinking not about self but you're thinking about the other person the good of the other then he says go to him alone go to that person privately don't make a big issue and he says if he hears you you have gained your brother Again, it's easy to say, well, I have gained the French. No, but the point is, is a brother is in God's church. He has not left the church. He's a brother. You are helping him or helping her to stay in God's church. That is the bigger picture. Because if you go and if you continue reading, he says, well, then take two or three witnesses, and then if that continues, let him be out of the church. So we're actually talking about something very serious that can affect that person's salvation and you are looking at it from the angle of what is the best for that person and so when you have a situation like that you've got to confront that situation in a godly manner in a godly way look at how Paul puts it here in 2nd Timothy in 2nd Timothy it's such an important scripture that people need to keep in mind whenever they look at Matthew 18. Whenever you look at Matthew 18, in fact, make a note next to Matthew 18, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 to 26, because that is the balancing scripture that goes with Matthew 18. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and 26. But a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. You know, quite often I, I have seen, I've been in church for many years, and you, like you probably have, I have done things that upset other people. And I've had people in church come to me, maybe off the church or whatever it is, says, you said this, George, I'm against you, and the Bible says I'm going to come and talk to you, and I'm going to tell you, bang, 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 bang. I'm sorry. I should have done it. But is the attitude of that person, is that the true Matthew 18 attitude, which is balanced with 2 Timothy, which says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. Was that done with gentleness? Able to teach and patient. And it says, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. In other words, in a spirit of humility, going to those people and say they are in opposition what in opposition is they are in opposition against themselves because they are in opposition against God and that's the sin they are affecting their own life that's the sin yes they end up sinning against you as it says in Matthew 18, 18 but they are in opposition to God to God's way but you approach them in humility and so, if you ever think about Matthew 18, and you think, well, I need to go and speak to somebody, etc., to read also 2 Timothy. And think about it. God, please help me to be gentle. Help me to look at it that it's not for myself, but I'm looking for the good of the other. And because I do have to confront the situation courageously, in other words, I'm, I really need courage to actually confront this issue. But help me to do it in a manner that is pleasing and honorable to you. 
in humility correcting those that are in opposition so that if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken which having been taken captive by him to do the devil's work so, so that you are helping them to get out of that problem so they can actually can be uh, saved Reverend, that puts a whole different angle into the, all this approach of confronting our difficulties courageously but in a godly manner and uh, that brings a balance to it a real balance to this which is important and in the end, we get down to a very in, important problem. And that's in Proverbs 16, verse 32. Proverbs 16, verse 32. Proverbs 16, verse 32. It's a beautiful and little nugget here that says, He that is slow to anger is better than a mighty. And he that rules his spirit, then he will take the sin. That's what God is looking for. God is shaping you and I to be his children that are slow to anger and that are able to rule our spirit. Because imagine if God was quick to anger and did not control his emotions. You and I would have been zapped long ago. Long ago. But God is merciful. And gives us time. And brethren, that's what we've got to learn to be with others. Because we need to look at them. At them better. At the better outcome of the others. Not myself. Or how as I have been of them. So that's uh, the fourth point I have here. The fifth one I have is turn losses to victories. Turn losses to victories. You know, you all have lessons, that things that we've learned, and um, things that we've lost. That, and, and you learn from those losses, those things that you've done wrong, and says, well, I'm not going to do it again, so that then you can have a victory. I mean, I always remember from very young, I was very technical in electricity and things like that and at that time I learned about Thomas Edison you and I, you probably know uh, about Thomas Edison uh, when he invented the light of power it was about the thousands attempt to do it and then it finally succeeded now imagine if he had given up at 999 you and I would not have the light bulb. okay somebody else would have been out for a long time. But, but anyway, it just shows that that perseverance and turn that loss to victory. Don't give up. Keep trying. Keep trying. Get up and don't quit. Look at Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, verse 15 and 16. Proverbs 24, 15 and 16. Do not, uh, do not lie in wait, a wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous do not plunder his resting place for a righteous man may fall seven times and then he quits no that's not all it says and you'll rise again and you'll rise again so brethren that's what you and I have to be we got to take, take whatever losses we have says that's not quitting let's not quit let's keep trying and let's keep going forward don't quit. James put it in another way. It says, listen, these, these trials that we have, if you look at James chapter 1, verse 2 and through 4. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you have different difficulties and trials and, and you still haven't succeeded. Because he says, because the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect. And so you keep trying and keep trying patiently until you and I are perfect, mature, 
being emotionally mature. Keep going, keep trying. And the other point is have faith in God. That's the sixth point I have. Increase your faith in God. You know, sometimes not addressing the problem is, is a problem itself. We've got to address it. We've got to handle the problem. But you know, as they used to say, it's 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. Well, you've got to rely on that 1%. Because it's as Paul says in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Brethren, we've got to have that absolute faith that through Christ we will be helped. There's much we can talk about faith. It's a subject area that we've talked a lot in the past. But let's just leave it at that. Keep faith. Don't, don't, forget the miracle worker. God is our miracle worker. He can work miracles. And He will work miracles for you and I. But He expects you and I to do our part. He expects us to do our part. And that's our seventh point. Is we, you and I, have to be doers. We have to be doers. As we are in James, James chapter 2, verse 20, James chapter 2 verse 20 says but do you want to know a foolish man that faith without works is dead this is like it said you know count it all joy when you have these difficulties because the testing of your faith but that faith requires us to be doing requires us to be doers to do our part to put it to practice we gotta be doers and we started by looking at Solomon Ecclesiastes. And he said, you know, everything is vanity. All this pursuit is vanity. But at the end of Ecclesiastes he says, but the end of the whole matter is to fear God. If you don't remember that, let's look at it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Right at the end. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter in verse 13. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including everything, whether good or evil. Leave it to God. Do your part. Remember that happiness is within problems are external challenges difficulty whatever they are they're external happiness is inside happiness requires emotional maturity to move to the way of giving for the good of the other yes to be able to express joy at the right time and to express sadness and sorrow and sympathy also at the right time but to be able to control our emotions in the right way it's not the result of, that, uh, of an accident. Happiness. Happiness is putting God first. Is accentuating the positive. Not crying over spilled milk. Avoiding arguments and bickering whenever we can. To confront our difficulties. To turn our losses into victories. To trust God that He can do what you and I can't do. But you and I have to do our part. Put these principles into action so that you and I may be truly happy and content. True happiness is indeed the result of careful, thought out, planned, diligent effort to become emotionally mature. With God's help, you and I can become perfect and mature and fully content and at peace because we fear Him, we obey Him, and we do the things that are pleasing in His sight.